Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Jack. That was beautiful. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as you are able for our opening prayer. I'll read the part of one, and as Macon would say, you read the part of y'all. Let us pray. Come, my light, and illumine my darkness. Come, my life, and revive me from death. Come, my physician, and heal my wounds. Come, my I invite you to remain standing as you are able for our hymn of gathering, which is O Spirit of the Living God. It can be found on page 539 of our hymnal or on the screen. Please let us all sing together. This will serve as our affirmation of faith on this Pentecost Sunday. Call for the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, cleansing fire, burn away all that is false and fruitless. Come, Holy Spirit, guiding fire, light the way through our wilderness. Come, Holy Spirit, refining fire, purify our words, our ways, our hearts. Come, Holy Spirit, prophetic fire, rouse us to courage and action. Come, Holy Spirit, empowering fire, inspire your gifts in us, send us to bless and change the world. Please be seated.
Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Blazing Holy Spirit of God, <clears throat> please let me keep my voice. <clears throat> I'll start over. Blazing Holy Spirit of God, thank you for calling us together today as remember, we remember the birth of your church at Pentecost. Lord God, through Jesus Christ, you have given us peace that the world cannot give. Let your spirit of truth abide with us so that we may live in hope, grow in faith, and keep your commandments of love. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Lord, we know we are all in need of your breath in us to become awake and alive in your spirit. People of God, where in the world or in your own lives do you notice or feel oppression or injustice? I invite you to name those before God. Take a moment. What is God calling us to do? Maybe God is pointing us to people who are kept from being free and awake. The Holy Spirit within us is the desire inside all of us that wants to keep connecting, relating, and communing. It isn't above us, it isn't beyond us, it is within us. People of God, where do you see hope freedom, liberation, and promise. I invite you to name that in silence now. God, breathe in us today so that we may be the people who strive for liberation, for peace, who welcome the stranger, and help those who are in need. Help us live out the gospel of love found in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in praising God for Judy this morning. And now I'd like to welcome Reverend Martha Rutland to share with us a ministry update about the bishop's offering this year as we prepare for the Florida Annual Conference. This Sunday and next Sunday, we will hear about special offerings, which we will collect on June 4th, next Sunday. Uh, but Martha's going to share with us about the Geraldine McClellan Scholarship. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, what a good group we have. <laughs> I guess you... Got it going well, thank you. I'm here to share with you about the Geraldine McClellan Scholarship Fund. Geraldine McClellan was the first black woman ordained in the Florida Conference of the United Methodist Church. She was also the first black district superintendent. Now she walked in the footsteps of her family, much as I did. Her, her grandfather and his two brothers were all ministers in what was the central jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church. For many years, we separated out the black church and the white church. We were segregated. And it wasn't until 1968 that we came together and formed one conference. And it was soon after that in 1972 that I was ordained as one of the first women in the United Methodist Church. And I still remember that vote. I was with my dad, and he, he's one of those clergy whose father and brother were ministers in this conference as well. And I remember watching the vote of all our friends, all the clergy vote, and it was about half and half. And I was like, 
How could that be? These are my friends. They know me. But they weren't quite ready for women ministers. That was new for the church, quite new for the church. And so there were a number of people that thought the church wasn't ready, much as they thought the church wasn't ready to desegregate and have black ministers. And here we are struggling with inclusion again with the whole LGBTQ community. Is the church ready to be the people of God, the whole people of God? Well, Geraldine was one of those leaders for us, bringing the black church to us and their ministries and their power and her preaching. I mean, this man, he'll make you say good morning, but Geraldine will make you say amen. <laughs> and furthermore, she'll have you saying hallelujah. She'll have you responsively joining her in ministry through her preaching and through her singing. She is quite the witness to God's love and power and call in her life. She was ordained in 1980 in the United Methodist Church after serving some time in the central jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church. One of the things that was her goal was support other African-American clergy in ministry. And so she was a mentor to many of the African women who followed her in ministry. And in fact, when Gammon Seminary, where she had gone to school, as did generations before her, one of the historically black seminaries of the United Methodist Church, of the church, when the dean's position came, when the president's position came open, she nominated one of her clergy sisters, one of the clergy women of the United Methodist Church in this conference, became the president of that seminary. And she was very touched by that support of a clergy sister, and it made a difference. In her mentoring, one of the things that they did, and let me tell you about that scholarship. Do you know one semester, because black schools are not historically funded as well as the white colleges have been. There is, and the students don't have as much, bring as much, so they have significant loans to get through school. And one semester costs $10,164. That's for one semester. So our, to fund our African-American students, they need scholarship support. And so Geraldine set up this fund with Candace Lewis, the new president at Gammon, to fund new ministers to help them have scholarship support. And our bishop is, has invited us to give. Next Sunday will be our special giving Sunday. And you may just want to take out an envelope and write out a check today because it will make a difference to these young clergy that feel called to the ministry called to the ministry in our church and have so much to give. So celebrate her ministry by contributing to this scholarship fund and, and it will bless our church. Amen. Thank you so much, Martha. This time I invite the ushers forward to click this morning's offering. Let us pray. Holy God, all that you have given us is yours. Blessing over blessing, gift upon gift, is your grace and your mercy of love. Help us, God, to be a people who continue that work to bless and give so that your church, your ministries, your mission, your kingdom might be made real in this world. That support for um, education and opportunity can make a difference for people discerning a call, for people living out their faith, for people finding their way, and for people who are in need. Bless and multiply all that is given today. 
Use it for your good work, God. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. be a great time to uh, pass the peace with one another to show a sign of uh, greetings and hello good to see you good morning happy Pentecost say hi to someone you know say hi to someone you don't know 
I'm the balcony. I'm the sound booth, tech booth. Hi over here, hi over there, hi in the choir, hi online, hi Judy. Today is Pentecost, and you might expect a sermon on Acts 2. I did that last year. So, we're going to spend some time staying in Exodus. So, I invite you to take the Bible you brought with you, the Bible in the pews, the Bible on your phone or tablet, the Bible that you've memorized word for word in your heart. Show of hands. No. Me neither. So, um... It will be in Exodus 3, 1 through 15. Uh, as you can recall, over the Sabbath series, we've been spending time in Exodus um, when Moses receives the Ten Commandments. We spent time with that fourth commandment, the command to Sabbath. Well, this is the prologue, the origin story of the Exodus story when Moses receives the call from the burning bush. Please hear the word of God. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight. And see why this bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Then God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am Who I am. God said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever and the title for all generations. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Will you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us and mold us. Fill us and use us. 
Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. Where is holy ground? Is it here in a sanctuary or in a cathedral? Or is holy ground outside at a cemetery or at a site of historical significance? What about a beach or a park or a forest? Maybe, just maybe, holy ground is right under your feet. Holy ground can be hard to describe. Is it a feeling? A glimpse? A pull in our gut? Chills on the backs of our necks? Surely we can seek out hallowed places where the earthly and the divine mingle in a mysterious manner. Places where only we and God can go. And holy ground can also at times sneak up on us. Are we paying attention to all of the holy ground that is around us? In the scripture reading from Exodus, notice that the Spirit of God does not call to Moses by name first. The first thing that happens is that Moses notices that the bush is burning but not consumed. Then he decides he's going to take a closer look. It is then when the Lord sees that Moses has noticed and is drawing near that the Spirit calls out, Moses, Moses. Are we waiting for God to yell at us to get our attention? To show us some grand gesture. To smack us upside the head. I wonder how many times the Spirit has been glimmering in our midst. And we have not noticed. We have the Acts story of Pentecost. Where the Holy Spirit descends upon the apostles after the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension. Where they proclaim the good news of Christ in all different languages so that all who have gathered here and thousands and thousands grow in their faith, come to faith. And then we have this story in Exodus. It doesn't make sense. Why is the spirit meek and timid here in Exodus, waiting for Moses to act first, almost, when at Pentecost, the spirit filled the upper room with a roaring wind and tongues of fire appeared above the apostles' heads? That seems much harder to miss, right? Well, I guess... It depends on which Pentecost moment you're you're reading. You see, before the Pentecost moment in Acts 2, there is another Pentecost moment in John 20. After Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to the disciples in a locked room. He shows them the wounds in his hands, and he says to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And then he breathes on them. And he says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. 
One of my doctoral professors, Dr. Dwight Judy, calls this moment the quiet Pentecost. As much as the Holy Spirit can roar and blaze, she can also whisper. Which means we are tasked with paying close attention for however the Spirit might show up in our midst. What do you need to put aside or to pick up in order to help you notice how the Spirit is at work in your life? This may look like taking on a spiritual practice, something that can root and anchor you to the divine source of love. This might look like talking with a trusted friend, a pastor, a spiritual director, or even a mental health professional to be a companion with you. And this may look like refraining from things that get in the way or cause distractions to your spiritual life. My prayer for you and for me is that we would become aware of what and who we need in order for us to be opened up to the Spirit as much as we can. Because there's a lot of holy ground out there that we might be missing. But why? Why is this important? Why do we need holy ground? Why do we need to be listening and looking for the Holy Spirit? What is the point of burning bushes and roaring wind and tongues of fire? I often hear Pentecost sermons or Bible studies that relate it to church growth, right? An exponential expansion of believers coming to faith, filling up the pews and weighing down the offering plates. I don't think that's the goal of Pentecost or of the Exodus story as, as well. I believe the purpose and promise of the Holy Spirit's beckoning and burning is liberation. Freedom from slavery. Freedom from captivity. Freedom from oppression. Freedom from sin. Freedom from death. The wild wind of God is a liberating wind, a freeing flame. And when we take note of the Spirit's mission to set free, to redeem, to save, and we choose then to draw nearer to God's cause of liberation, we become filled with that same wind, fueled by that same flame. Liberation becomes then our very breath. So, people of God, now that you have noticed the Spirit's presence in your life and have been filled with the breath of liberation, what are we going to do with it? Well, what did Moses do? Or the disciples, or Peter? Moses, after trying to come up with excuse after excuse for why God should not have called him, was empowered by the Spirit to free the oppressed Israelites from slavery in Egypt under Pharaoh. The Spirit calls for liberation. The disciples gathered and praying in a locked room were met by Jesus who gave them the Holy Spirit and said, go and forgive free people from the bondage of sin and suffering. The Spirit calls for liberation. Peter, constantly bumbling and blazing in his discipleship, proclaimed to the masses 
The story of God's people, of Jesus Christ's loving sacrifice on a cross that sets us free from sin and death. The Spirit calls for liberation. Being filled with the Holy Spirit means working towards freedom and new life wherever there is none. The Spirit calls for liberation. Who is not free today? Where in your life are you not free? Who in our community, in our world, suffers from oppression and injustice? Things that at our baptism we vow to resist. Is it the workers in our community who can't afford to live here because the cost of housing is far too high? It's not just workers. It's high everywhere. Is it those who struggle with addiction or with their mental health? Because too often, resources and medicine are unaffordable and inaccessible. Creating a vicious cycle of pain and isolation. Is it our black and brown and Asian siblings who are still facing racism, prejudice, and discrimination in our country? Is it queer and trans young people who are bullied at school, abused at home, and condemned in churches? Is it the chronically sick and terminally ill who are in a prison of their own body that is failing them? Folks, people are not free. Oppression and injustice are alive and well, it seems. But can I give you some good news? The Spirit of God who seeks liberation and restoration for all of creation is also alive and well in this world. So come on, Moses. Come on, Peter. Come on, neighbor and sibling and friend and stranger and preacher. It is time for all of us to notice what the Spirit of God is up to in this world and in our lives. To choose to draw nearer still to the work of God. To become stirred awake by God's wind and set ablaze by God's fire. So that we might live into Christ's mission, which Christ says is this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is straight from Jesus' mouth, which he's plagiarizing from the prophet Isaiah. So if you don't know how you feel yet about this liberation stuff, I hear you. And I just want to say, it's biblical. This is who Christ is. And this is who the Spirit is calling us to be. Co-liberators for any and all in our world who are burdened by the shackles of powers and principalities, of systems and institutions, of sin and suffering. All of us, all of creation are in some way or another in need of freedom. 
And when you are free, I am free. When you are not free, I am not free. Something is happening. A fire is burning. A wind is rustling. Will we notice it? I pray we will. So that we might take off our shoes, metaphorically, and spend some time with God by the fire. That we might be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus calls you by name to go and proclaim good news, to go and forgive, to go and set free that you would respond like Moses. Here I am. If this is your prayer, your hope, your call this morning, I invite you to open up your heart or put your hand over your heart and join me in saying, here I am. Am. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. May it be so. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as you are able as we continue worshiping with our hymn of response. Holy Spirit, Truth Divine, which can be found on page 465 in the hymnal or the words on the screen. With the breath of the Holy Spirit, let us sing. Spirit, the wind of God, the breath of hope and resurrection, to go and proclaim good news, to set captives free, to bring about new life, 
May Pentecost keep going, keep flaming in you and in us today and in the days ahead. In the power of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.